In this video, we'll talk about Pidgin and Creole languages, which are languages that are born out of the contact of previously existing ones. And by the way, if you speak French, can you try to read this sign? It is from a French-based Creole spoken in the island of Guadeloupe in the Caribbean. And it says, slow down, children are playing here. The first thing I want to do is that I want to show you a video from a language spoken in the Caribbean. And I want you to try to pay attention to it and see how much you can understand from what they're saying. Or pastor, then him come sit down a street side with the boy and them, and in chat, see him way with them, come dress down, see him way. Same thing with the scripture, just come at Jesus, the right here, so we are chat with me, see him way. Could you understand? So there are a few words in there that might have been familiar, but it was probably very difficult for you to understand if you don't speak this language related to English, Jamaican Creole English. I'm going to play it again, this time with subtitles in the dialect of English that we speak. Or pastor, then him come sit on a street side with the boy and them, and in chat, see him way with them, come dress down, see him way. Same thing with the scripture, just come at Jesus, the right here, so we are chat with me, see him way. All right, so as you can see, again, you might have recognized some words, but it's a very different language. It is clearly related to English, but it's still very different. Just a quick example is that one of the words she said was the boy them. This means the boys. And why them is very interesting because the fusional morphology of English became isolating morphology in Jamaican Creole English. So in English, you have the suffix the, for the plural, the S in boys, and this became its own separate word, which comes from the word them and became the marker of the plural. So why them means boys. Isolating morphology, like you would have in Vietnamese, for example. So Jamaican Creole English is a language that, it, that is related to English, and it is a new language. So how do these languages come about? In previous videos, we studied multilingualism, which are situations where two languages are spoken alongside each other in a society. For multilingualism to exist, societies need to have certain conditions. For example, the languages are usually closely related. In the case of Canada, English and French are both European languages, so they are very close. Um, same in Switzerland, for example, they are all Indo-European languages. Multilingualism requires prolonged and regular contact between the languages and the communities. So people would intermarry across the communities. They would go to the same schools. They would share the same spaces and so forth. Multilingualism also requires a relatively symmetrical power relationship between the communities. So again, in spaces like in Canada or Switzerland or Belgium, you see that both communities have representation in government, have some power to make decisions and so forth. So these are the kinds of conditions in a society that would allow two languages to exist alongside each other for prolonged periods of time. There are um, situations where humans come in contact with one another that, are, that have different conditions. For example, a new language might develop if you have two languages that are very structurally different and contact between the communities is occasional or sporadic. For example, if you were in a taxi somewhere in a country very far away and you don't speak their language and they don't speak your language. So what's going to happen? You two are going to try to develop a code as best as you can with some words from here, some words from there to try to understand each other so that you can go where you're going. Such a communication code would be a pigeon. A pidgin is a combination of languages that maybe has some words from English, some words from the language of the taxi driver. It's not very linguistically complex because you don't know each other's language, so you can't create a lot of structure. It's mostly just content words. These kinds of communication systems have very limited domains. So just when there's a transaction going on, for example. And there's no native speakers. Pidgin languages are is something that happens on the spot. These lang uh, pidgins usually happen when you have, for example, trading relationships like this um, 
there is a language called the Basque Icelandic Pidgin, which was shared by whalers from the Basque country that went up to Iceland and needed to communicate with people from Iceland. So, Chris Maria presenta for mi balia, for mi presenta for you bustana. This, if Christ and Mary give me a whale, I will give you the tail. Some words like for me and for you are based on Icelandic, and some words like balia and bustana are from Basque. So you see that if there's enough contact between the whalers from the Basque country and people in Iceland, there will be some mixed code that will develop for them to communicate with one another to satisfy this sporadic contact that they have. This is a pidgin language. There is another circumstance in which, um, I'll come back to this map in a moment, but there is another circumstance in which pidgin languages and Creole languages can develop, which is if there are major power imbalances in a community. For example, if one community has all the political power and the other community has practically none of the political power. If this situation happens, you're also going to have a community where there's very little contact between the two because some people will be in school and having power and some people will not. They will be in completely separate spaces. You could also have a situation where there's power imbalances, there's sporadic content, and the languages are structurally different, like the languages from Europe and the languages from Africa, for example. And you can see in this map of the location of pidgin and creole languages around the world that there are indeed many languages um, in the South Pacific, in, the, in Melanesia, but most of them are concentrated on the west coast of Africa and on the eastern coasts of the Americas. And this is because one very common situation that led to the creation of new languages was slavery in the, from the 1600s to the end of the 1800s. So enslaved people were kidnapped from Africa and brought to the Americas to uh, work in sugar plantations, for example. Most people uh, ended up in, kidnapped in Brazil, which uh, took um, incredible amounts of people from Africa from the 1500s to the end of the 1800s. Many were kidnapped to the Caribbean and to North America. And something particularly cruel happened. Enslaved people were grouped so that they can communicate with one another and they can they can plot to overthrow the uh, the people who owned the colonies because they were grouped uh, in in groups that spoke many different african languages the enslaved people had to come up with some way to communicate with one another and in doing this they mixed elements from the different african languages that they spoke with the elements of the colonial language of the place they were in which might have been English in North America, Spanish in the Caribbean, Portuguese and Dutch in South America, Arabic in Eastern Africa. So you have mixtures of African languages with these colonial languages, and this also gave rise to new languages. And by the way, none of these are like simple or wrong versions of the European language. As we'll see, they have a lot of complexity in them. So First, what happened is that probably pigeons started to come along so that people could barely do transactions with one another. But then children were born into the community and these children would learn the pigeon languages. And in doing so, they injected a lot of complexity into them, turning a pigeon into a Creole language. A Creole language is a full-fledged language with all the complexity that we've seen in the other languages we've studied in the class. They have fixed structures. They are used for every domain because children grow up using them. And again, because children were born with this language, there are native speakers to Creole languages, which makes these languages uh, not only more used, but also more regular in their structures. By the way, the Hawaiian the one that's called Hawaiian Pidgin is a Creole language because children were born and they were taught from birth to speak in this language. I want to show you an example of uh, what a Creole language sounds like. This is an example from Jamaican Creole English. We're going to start with what we call the lexifier language, English, which provides many of the content words. And then we're going to get more Creole, more Creole, more Creole. Oh, I'm sorry. Let me go back. 
The north wind and the sun were disputing which was the stronger, when a traveller came along wrapped in a warm cloak. The north wind and the sun were disputing which was the stronger, when a traveller came along wrapped in a warm cloak. The north breeze and the sun are argue about who stronger than who, when one traveller come wrap up in our sweater. The north wind and the sun did a cuss about which one of them stronger, when them see one man come well wrap up in our seat and look like our winter cloak. Mm -hmm. So all of these are Jamaican Creole, but they are all slightly different. What we have with Creoles is that they have a continuum of forms that look more like the Lexifier language, for example, more like the Queen's English, and more like a full-fledged Creole language. In between them, we have forms that resemble the lexifier, which we're going to call acrolects, and then forms that go more towards full creolization, which are the mesolects and the basilects. And as you can hear in the previous recording, basilects are fairly different from the lexifier language. And then a speaker of, the, of a creole language would be able to go back and forth between these different styles. For example, with their family, they're probably going to speak more and more basilectal creole, probably lecturing at a university, they're going to speak a more acrolectal form of the Creole. And again, these languages are not simplified versions of the lexifier. They have a lot of complexity in them. This is an example from the language Bislama, which is a Creole language from Vanuatu in the South Pacific. Bislama was formed from English and from elements of the languages of Vanuatu. And you can see how complex the verbal conjugations are. So for the verb laugh, which is laugh, you have four numbers, singular, dual, tri trio, and plural. So one person, two people, three people, four, uh, many people. And you also have a distinction between the exclusive and the inclusive first person, uh, plural. So for example, the exclusive we means we are having dinner you are not. The inclusive we means we are all having dinner, including you who I'm talking to. So as you can see, there are four numbers and more distinctions in the pronouns than the original English had. So these languages are not mere simplifications of English or Spanish or Dutch. In summary, Pidgin and Creole languages are born out of situations where human, humans can't understand one another. They can be whalers trying to go to Iceland, or they can be enslaved people trying to figure out how to survive. What happens first is that a pigeon is born, which is a code with relatively little structure. But then, as children are born, the pigeon becomes a Creole, which is a full-fledged language with all the complexity that we have studied. Creoles have, are a continuum, really, with forms that are more acrolectal, that resemble the lexifier language, and with forms that are more meso and basilectal, which resemble more the full-fledged creole.